Well, good morning. How are you today? Oh, y'all were not ready for that. I knew it. I, I knew you weren't. All right. Let's try that again. Good morning. Oh, good deal, good deal. Hey, my name is Ryan, and I am so honored to be here in the great hall with you guys at Park Cities Baptist Church. Uh, I'm thankful you're in the room with us, and I'm also thankful for every one of you that are watching right now online. So whether you're online or in the room, I'm going to ask you to do two quick things. Number one, get your Bible, okay? Whether that is your physical paper copy, you know, ancient manuscript right here, or whether you have a, an electronic copy. So open up your Bible or turn that thing on to 1 Timothy chapter number 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, we are in this series called Paradox and uh, it is an honor to step into this series with all the pastors here at Park Cities. But uh, today we are landing in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and uh, we're going to talk about what does it look like in this day and time for you and I in a radical age of individualism to live in cooperation with one another. So 1 Timothy chapter 4, that's the first thing I want you to do. But secondly, whether you're online or in the room, I want you to get something to take notes with. So look at your neighbor and say, yeah, he's talking to you. Go ahead, tell him right now. Would you do that? Uh, find something, because every dude in the house looked at their wife and like, you got this, babe? No, you take notes, uh, write this down, because God has something. I believe he wants to speak to you today. And it's amazing what happens when we don't just get into a room and listen, but we actually lean in and participate. So I will ask you, randomly throughout the message to say something to your neighbor. I'm not talking to your neighbor back at home. I'm talking to the one sitting right beside you right now. It'll be awkward, but it'll be awesome, okay? I'll ask you to do that randomly, but I really want you to lean in by taking notes, uh, writing things down. Maybe you're the artistic person in, and you'll actually just draw out the sermon. I had a uh, young lady in my student ministry who was an artist, and uh, so instead of taking notes, she drew notes, and, uh, and her parents got on to her at first for this. They're like, hey, stop drawing pictures in church. Like, take notes. And, and by the end of the message, she would literally have the entire message not written out but drawn out because she thought in pictures. Um, well, we leveraged that early on when I was traveling, and uh, I actually took her for, for several events and while I was preaching, literally didn't tell her what I was preaching, but as I was preaching, she'd be behind me with this blank canvas and she would literally be painting out what I was preaching. So don't get onto your kids for drawing pictures, all right? You never know how God is going to use that. Well, we are here today, and before I jump into the message, uh, I want to introduce you to my family. Uh, they're going to throw them up on the screen there. Again, my name is Ryan Fontenot, and uh, I have a wife. Her name is Heather, and we have three kiddos, Elin, Enley, and True. Now, typically, they're just on the screen, but actually, they're here with me today. Y'all stand up real quick. Would you do that? Just stand up and wait. Y'all welcome my family here today with me. Come on, everybody. Well, that's three of the four. Uh, we're smart. We sent the four-year-old to We Worship. Praise God for We Worship and all the children's workers. Amen. Come on, somebody. And uh, so I'm super thankful for them. Uh, I get to travel all over the country with our ministry called Rage Ministries. And no, it's not an anger management ministry. And no, we're not mad. But we do have an intense passion. And that is to reach. Everybody say reaching. Okay, that was not good at all. We'll try it again. I told you, you weren't ready. Everybody say reaching a generation endangered. How many of you have ever heard of endangered species? Hold your hands up high. No, we're not trying to rescue spotted owls or killer whales or things like that. But what we are passionate about is going after the next generation, known today as Generation Z. It's a generation that is in desperate radical need of the gospel. See, do you realize that a recent study of teens here in the United States revealed some startling facts about the spiritual state of this next generation? The first thing it revealed was that Generation Z teens are the most atheistic generation the United States has ever known. I'll say that again. 
Generation Z teens are the most atheistic generation that our country has ever known. As a matter of fact, when surveyed, 30 Five percent. That's one out of every three teenagers in the U.S. claim to be atheist, agnostic, or have no religious affiliation at all. One out of every three. Not only did they discover that this generation is more atheistic, not surprisingly, we found out that they are less Christian than any other generation we've ever known. As a matter of fact, when they were surveyed, 4%, again, I know it's not quite noon yet, so that's four out of every 100 teens in the U.S., only 4% hold to a biblical world view. That means only four out of every hundred teens in the U.S. see the world through the biblical lens. As well, there are 10% fewer teens today who claim to be followers of Jesus than just the generation before them. That means, church, we're not gaining ground. We're actually losing ground. And that is why weeks like the gathering that you're hosting this week at Park Cities, going after teenagers with the gospel of Jesus, equipping them to go after their friends with the good news of Jesus. That is why it's so important what we're doing with the next generation. That's why I believe things like we worship, it's not just babysitting, amen? It is pouring the truths of God into these young children and to teenagers in this place. And so I get to travel all over the country with that passion, with that desire, and... I don't think it's just coincidence that I happen to be here today on this morning assigned this text. I believe it is a sovereign act of God because what we're going to read in 1 Timothy chapter 4 beginning in verse number 6, what we're going to read this morning is actually some clues That you and I must get in our lives, not just individually, but corporately, if we are going to see this generation reach like never before. Cooperation in an age of individualism which actually is a massive heartbeat about our ministry. If you'll search any social media, write this hashtag down. Hashtag, don't, you know you don't know what you're doing if you wrote the word hashtag out, all right? But, but hashtag, we are rage. We are rage, which simply stands for we, everybody say we, are, everybody say are, reaching a generation endangered. See, we know at Rage Ministries that going after this next generation is such a massive task. It's not a me thing. It is a we thing. The heartbeat of our ministry is to help everyone in the church, every believer understand that reaching teens today is not just a Ryan thing, not just a rage thing. Man, it is a we thing. Look at your neighbor and say, (laughs) he's talking to you right now. Go ahead and tell him, all right? He's talking to you. Guys, today, let's jump into 1 Timothy chapter 4, Let's start in verse number six, where Paul writes to this young pastor, Timothy. And here's what he says. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Jesus Christ. You'll be trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Look at what he says. He says, have nothing to do with irreverent or silly TikTok videos Okay, it doesn't say that, but it, it, it could have, right? It says, have nothing to do with irreverent or ignorant Instagram posts. Come on, somebody, are you with me? He says, no, have nothing to do with irreverent or silly Facebook mess. Okay, I'll stop. All right, here we go. Have nothing to do with irreverent or silly mess, but rather, say it with me, church, read it together, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end, we toil 
and we strive. Why? Because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and especially, or particularly, or uniquely of those who, what church? Who believe. So here's what you do, Timothy. Here's what we do, church. Look close. Command and teach these things. And the youth ministry verse for all ages is found in the next passage, which says this, and let no one despise you for your youth or let no one look down on you because you are young. <laughs> look at your neighbor and say, that includes you. Go, go ahead. I know. I know. Some of y'all need that today, okay? That no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example how? In, say it, speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. And then he says, until I come, devote yourselves to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching, and do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by the prophecy when the council of the elders laid their hands on you. And then he says, in closing, practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress and keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save yourself. Come on, church, and who else? Your hearers. Lord, I pray today that you would honor the reading of your word. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would teach us today. Jesus, I pray that you would be glorified and magnified and lifted high today because we know as you are lifted up, you will draw all men to yourself. So Lord, do a work that no one else gets credit for but you. In Jesus' name and all the church said, amen. See, we believe that reaching this next generation is not a solo sport. It's not something I need to do on my own. It's something we all have a role to play in. We all have a part to play. But if we as a church are going to go after this next generation, if we are actually going to live godly lives in a godless generation, then we need to, to know how. So I want to ask you today, and I want us to examine today this question. How do we grow in godliness? How? How do you and I grow in godliness? But listen, not just as individuals, but how do we grow in godliness together? I believe together there are four things we can see in this passage that will enable us, equip us, and make us capable of growing in Christ's likeness like never before. Number one, write this down. If we are to grow in godliness together, we need to write it down, soak in the scriptures. When I say write it down, I really meant that. Some of y'all are just staring at me like I'm crazy. Write it down. I really believe that if you and I are going to grow, if we're going to flourish, if we're going to live a godly life in a godless world, if we're going to be light in the darkness that God has called us to be, if we're going to be the city on a hill that God has created us and saved us and empowered us to be, then what we must first do is we've got to soak up the scriptures. We can no longer be satisfied with just bringing our Bibles to church, opening them up when the pastor says, open up your Bible, but we've got to daily spend time in the word of God. Uh, again, 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul says this. He says, if you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Jesus Christ. My question is, what, are the, what is he talking about if you put these things? What things are we to put before the brothers and sisters? What is it that you and I are to daily keep in front of us except the word of God? Look, look at your neighbor real quick and just tell him this. 
you need to read your Bible. Would you tell them that right now? Somebody needed to hear it. You need to read your Bible. He says, listen, put these things in front of them. And he says, here's what you need to do. You need to train yourself for godliness. When you and I say yes to Jesus as king, when you and I bow our hearts to the sovereign authority of Jesus over our lives, when we turn from sin, trust in Christ, when we say, Jesus, you are Lord and I'm ready for you to be my Lord, our unrighteousness has been laid on him, which he paid for on the cross. All of his righteousness is imputed or put on us. But now... As we have sure, firm standing in Jesus, now we are to grow in Jesus. I was saved at 18 years old. I grew up in church most of my life. I knew a lot of the answers. I like to tell people like this. I knew all about Jesus, but I didn't know Jesus. At 18 years old, God opened my eyes and I realized, man, what I needed was not another sermon, not another song, not another worship service. What I needed in that moment was a savior. And the moment I bowed all that I knew of me and gave to all that I knew of Jesus, man, everything changed. But here's the truth. I'm not 18 anymore. It's been a minute. I've, I've walked with Jesus for a while. And here's my prayer. That the Ryan at 18 years old, the moment Jesus saved me, looks a lot different at now 2021 Ryan who's been walking with Jesus for a long time. Amen? And if you are in Jesus, the Bible says that you and I are to grow in godliness. And one of the ways that we grow is that we eat and we feast on the word of God. That's why he tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 11, he says, command and teach these things until I come, look close, devote yourselves to the public reading of what? It's not a trick question. It's on the screen. Y'all got this. Y'all can do it. We got this. Until I come, devote yourselves to the public reading of scriptures and to exhortation and to teaching. So Paul tells Timothy, listen, if you want to grow in godliness and you want to grow in godliness as a body of believers, it begins by getting in the word of God. No wonder in his second letter to Timothy, he would write these words in 2 Timothy 3, 16. Look close. All scripture. If you have a Bible, would you just hold it up for me right now? Would you just hold your Bible up? You got a Bible in the room or even on your phone? That's awesome. I see those bright, shiny Bibles. I love them, all right? Yeah, yeah, all of it, all of it, all of the, every translation you have, all of your, all the scripture, it is breathed out by God. And it's not just breathed out by God, but it's profitable. It's useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Look close. That the man, look at somebody and say, and whoa, man, go ahead, tell them, all right? That the man and woman of God may be what, church? Complete, mature. They may actually grow up fully equipped for every good work. See, if we want to live a godly life in a godless world, it will not happen apart from a regular walk in the word of God. No wonder many Christians find the spiritual discipline of daily Bible reading to be one of the most difficult to do. You ever wonder why that is? I believe Because the enemy knows it's absolute spiritual warfare. You ever wonder why you go to read your Bible and your phone starts dinging? The baby starts crying? Your mind goes off in a thousand directions thinking about all that you have to do? You ever wonder why you're like, I'm getting up this morning. I'm going to read the word. I'm going to get after it. And your alarm goes off and you hit it and you hit it and you hit it and you hit it. And then 45 minutes later, you're like, I should have gotten up. I'm late. And what happens to your Bible? It stays there on the nightstand. Anybody ever been there besides me? Come on, somebody hold your hand up. I feel a little alone. Okay, perfect. All right. 
No wonder Donald Whitney would say this. No spiritual discipline is more important than the intake of God's word. That's a big statement. No spiritual discipline is more important than the intake of God's word. Nothing can substitute for it. There's simply no healthy Christian life apart from a diet of the milk and the meat of Scripture. So if we as a church, we as a people want to live a life of godliness in a godless world, we must get in the word. Secondly, write this down. Not only must we together Soak in the scripture. Secondly, together, we have to set the example. Let me just say it like this. The Bible is not meant for mere information. As a matter of fact, there's enough Bible knowledge amongst all of us here to be super dangerous. See, the Bible isn't meant just to be a textbook that we know. It is to be a living word that transforms. See, you and I weren't meant just to know the word of God. We were meant to actually obey the word of God. No wonder in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 12, he says this, Let no one despise you for your youth, but, say it with me somebody, set the believers, oh, thank y'all very much. I was making sure. I didn't hear y'all, so I want to make sure y'all are with me. Set the believers an example in what? In speech. Look at somebody and say, watch your mouth. Go ahead, tell them, all right. Would you do that? Set your example in speech. And then in conduct. Look at somebody and say, watch what you're doing. Go, go ahead, tell them, all right, right now. So watch your mouth. Watch what you're doing. And he says, set the example in love. Hey, say, guard your heart. Go ahead, tell somebody right now. Say, guard your heart. And then he says, in faith, write to them, look at them right now and say, be careful what you're believing. Go ahead, go ahead, tell them. And then lastly, in purity, look at somebody and say, clean yourself up. Go ahead, tell them, clean yourself up, right? Guys, here's, he said, listen, if you want to live an example, here's how we set the example in what we say, what we do, what we love, what we believe and how we live. He says, set the example, raise the bar. And what our world is looking for out of Christians is not just those who claim to believe different, but those who are actually living different. Oh, they may hate it. It may be a stench in their nostrils, but it it, it disarms them from the ancient, complete, total weapon they have of saying, you're just a bunch of hypocrites. Guys, when we don't just say we believe the word, but we walk it out, everything changes. No wonder James said, be doers of the word. We're not just to come here and write Bible stuff down. We're not just to read the Bible. We're actually to live it out. So here's my question. If you and I are not just to soak up the scriptures, but we're to set the example, here's my question. If people followed your example, would they look today more like Jesus each day or less like Jesus each day? I can't answer that for you. All I know is Paul told the church in Corinth, follow me as I follow Jesus. Are you willing to tell those around you today that same thing? Hey, you want to know what it looks like to live like Christ? Just follow me. Just hang out with me. Just look at what I'm listening to. Just hear how I talk. Just watch how I live. See, our lives are meant to be light in a dark world. So we're not just to soak up the scriptures together. We are to actually set the example together. Everybody with me? Just tell me right now. I'm with you, Ryan. Let me hear you. Oh, okay, perfect. All right, because we got two more points, and here it is. If we want to live as godly people in a godless world, together we must soak up the scriptures. Together we must set the example, but write this one down together. We have to stay the course. Would you just look at someone around you right now and tell them this, do not quit. Tell them right now, right now, everybody in the room. 
I'm looking around. Everybody do it. Do it. Let's try it again. Look at someone around you and tell them, do not quit. Go ahead right now. Tell somebody. Somebody right now in this room, somebody watching online, they are ready to quit. They're ready to call it quits. They're ready to cash it in. They're ready to fold it, guys. And I'm telling you, Christ has called us to run the race. I love, in 1 Timothy, he says it again, don't neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. But here's what he said. He said, but practice these things immerse yourself in them so that all may see your what? Your progress. He says, Timothy, listen, if you don't immerse yourself in these, if you don't walk this stuff out, do you see it? If you don't immerse, if you don't soak yourself up, if you don't practice it and walk this stuff out, you're not going to progress. You're not going to keep on. You're going to quit. I believe one of the reasons we're seeing a a, a move of deconstructionism in Christianity, we're seeing people walk away from the faith. I believe part of it is, is because they stopped immersing themselves in the scriptures and they stopped walking this stuff out. And they were trying to do life alone when we were meant to do life together. And therefore they're tapping out, walking out instead of continuing to run the race. Never forget this church. Godliness, just like the Christian life, it is not a sprint. It's a marathon. And I hate marathons. Can I get an amen, somebody, all right? The idea of running 26.2 miles, ouch. I'm like, let's do 50-yard dash. I'm in. I mean, I ain't going to win, but I'll do it, all right? But, but, but man, this, we often in our life, we love the microwave right now, my way, right away. Let's go, instantaneous, 60-second video, 15-second godliness, and it doesn't happen that way. I love what one author said. Godliness is just the simplicity of long obedience in the right direction. And if you and I will commit to running this race as a marathon, we will not tap out, but rather we will continue on, keeping on, keeping on. God will shift us. God will change us. We'll look back another year, another five years, another 10 years from now, and we won't even recognize that person anymore because he will continue to form us and shape us. See, this is the paradox. We think we can do this alone but we can't. You were not meant to run alone. You know, I'll never run a marathon because I ain't, jo- I, ain't, I ain't joining a running program. Because I know if I join a running program, what's, it, what's in a running program? It's accountability and people around me. And I'll know I have to do it. But as long as I'm just like, I'll try it myself. I won't have to be accountable. You know what I'm saying? Come on, you're with me, you know. But you see, in Christianity, we weren't meant to run. This is why this matters. This is why gathering here to worship matters. This is why getting in circles matters. This is why running together matters, which leads me to the fourth and final point. Do not miss this. See, if we want to live godly in a godless world, we have to understand we've got to live a life that soaks up the scriptures, that sets the example, a life that stays the course, doesn't tap out and doesn't quit. And lastly, write this down. If we're going to live godly in a godless world together, we must stick with others. Would you look at someone beside you right now and say this to them? I need you. Tell them that right now. Would you do that right now? Right now. I need you. Now, I want you to look at them or someone else and simply tell them this as well. And you need me. Tell them that right now. Go ahead, tell them. You need, some of y'all needed to tell someone that already. Y'all are like, yes, I like that one a lot more, right? But the truth is, we need each other. We were not made to walk alone. Again, he closes out this portion by saying this. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save you say you expect him to say you'll just you'll save yourself, but he doesn't. He says, by doing this, you will save both yourself, say it with me, church, and your hearers. See, the paradox is this: we are in this together. 
That, that phrase became so popular during the COVID outbreaks. We're all in this together. Do you realize they're just ripping off the church? Because church, we've always been in this together. See, if you're in this room and you're a follower of Jesus, there was that time like me when I was 18 where I bowed my life to Jesus. He was knocking on the door of my heart. I invited him in to be my Lord, God, Savior, and King. Maybe you were 18, maybe you were eight, maybe you were 80. But if you are in Christ and Christ is in you, that is an individual thing, thing that happens. Like, like we don't corporately get saved, right? It's not like, all right, we all got saved. No, you individually, the Bible says you must confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And you must believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Then you will be saved. I was saved individually. But you know what happened immediately? The moment I was saved by Christ... I, the Bible says we're adopted into the family. At the moment that I individually said yes to Jesus, I was put into a family known as the church, the, the, the family of God. That's why if you're a believer, we're brothers and sisters. Why? Because we have the same spiritual daddy. You don't even know me. Welcome, nice to meet you. Family reunion every Sunday, here we are. See guys, why? Because we were not made to walk alone. We're saved individually but we're immediately put into the family. Together, we run this race. That's why if there's anything you take away, here it is. You were not made to run this race alone. And if you're in this room, man, it's your very first time here. Welcome, it's my first time also and you're looking for a church home, you're looking for a group of believers to run with, maybe this is the place you need to be. And so right after service today, uh, Morgan's gonna come up and point you to next steps. Maybe your next step is to go out to this table and say, I need a group my age, my demographic, whatever, that I need to run with. I need some people. I can't run alone. I can't do it anymore. You're in this room full of people, and you feel more alone than you've ever felt before. Do not leave that way. Maybe this is the place you're supposed to call home. Maybe though you're in here and you're like, man, I don't even understand all this. But that whole Jesus thing you're talking about, Jesus saving you, changing you, like, like I wanna know more about that. And so at the end of this service, as she points you to next steps, I want you to go to that table and here's all you gotta tell whoever's there. Hey, I wanna know more about following Jesus. I'm telling you, it's in that moment where you say yes to him as king that everything changes. Whatever your next step is, listen to me close. We're here for you. You don't have to do this alone. And that's why I love the way the writer of Hebrews, he just challenges us with his words. He says, and let us consider, let us think of ways to stir one another up. To what? To love and good works. Do you see see this togetherness here? Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. And let us not neglect meeting together as is the habit of some, but encouraging, say it with me, everybody, encouraging who? One another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So Lord, I pray right now that we would be a people that refuse to run alone. We refuse to live alone. We refuse to try to walk with you alone. We would rather run together until you call us home. God, I believe you call Park City's Baptist Church for this time, this place, this season to live a life as light in this world. I pray that Park City's would shine bright. And God, this week as we gather together with students, that they would be saved, they would be changed, they would be ignited with a fresh passion like never before. And God, we cannot do this alone. So Lord, help us to pray. Lord, help us to press in. And Lord, help us to live in such a way as to run for the prize. We love you. We thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, and everyone in the house said, amen.